Very, very well. She's very wealthy, but she couldn't sign a contract or vote. She was a woman in the 1800s. She needed to get married again. She ran the businesses herself and needed, needed to be able to do things that's not contract. So she marries a lawyer, 20 years her junior. Nicely done, little cougar action. And becomes Madame Delphine Lalaurie. They move into this house, the Lalaurie Mansion, 1820 to 1834. Now, 14 years of throwing great parties. When I say great parties, three types of entertainment, two or three meals served. The best, the best food in New Orleans was at the Lalaurie Mansion. Her kitchen staff were kitchen slaves, were legendary. She kept them chained to the stove so they couldn't wander off when cooking needed to be done. We'll get into that in a minute. But now, Madame Delphine, interesting woman, she threw these wild parties that were well attended, but when she would set up entertainment, she'd like a band or a play yeah. produced by current events, she would disappear and come back downstairs after it was done in a new outfit showing up the latest fashions from Spain or France. Change her clothes three and four times during the night. Fascinating woman. Okay, you're good. So, interesting woman hated by her neighborhood. Much as they, they hate her now. I mean, look, they got hundreds of people every day kind of screaming about bloody murder across the street. But at that time, Madame Delphine was the only slave owner in the French Quarter that kept an active whipping post. I mean, somebody strapped to it so she could beat them with a horse whip. But she did this herself. She was very interested in the discipline of her slaves. And she kept 30 slaves. That's like an agricultural number. That's way too many for this size house. And then her slaves would disappear, eight or ten a year, which is go missing. She claimed they committed suicide. Very sketchy. Nobody else had that problem. So... Madame Delphine's neighbors couldn't stand her. They were constantly treated to the screams of people being beaten in her courtyard. They couldn't see it, but they could hear it all the time. Awful. Then in 1834, the beginning and the end, that window up there, it shatters. The one that's covered in stucco down and it hits the ground. All right? How old are you, kiddo? Yeah. You're turning 12? All right, so you've been all made. But Because um, Madame Delphine, well, Madame Delphine was beating a 10-year-old slave girl to death. Here's what happened. A little 10-year-old slave girl shatters the window there. The glass hits the ground. She's about to jump out the third floor. People, more than a dozen on the street, it's the middle of the day, they look up and go, what's going on? What? No, don't jump. And they see somebody grab her by the hair and pull her back into that rounded balcony. So angry, she doesn't bring her downstairs to the whipping post. She ties her little wrist to that railing on the rounded balcony. Now, we can see this from here. This is not a whipping post hidden inside the courtyard. The little girl is screaming, stop, she's going to help me. She's going to kill me. Please don't stop. Help me. And she's trying to pull her arms out of the socket. She's tied tight to that railing. Then M. Delphine comes back out with a horse whip, rips her dress off her back and in front of more than a dozen people, beats a 10-year-old child to death in public. Now, the little kid is, there are two stories. One says either she jumped off the balcony to escape the beating and hits the ground. The other said she was hit so hard her little frail body flipped off the balcony. We don't know. And her hands all covered with blood just slipped through the, the binding and she fell. Madame Delphine goes inside. The police had been called, of course, but what could they do? Madame Delphine wouldn't let him in the house. And she technically had not committed a crime because she owned the child. The child was not a human being. The child was three-fifths of a person. In America, in the 1800s, one drop African, one great-great-grandparent, one thirty-second, and you were not a person. You were three-fifths of a human being. So the neighborhood is not happy at all. They're like done with crazy across the street. So they get together and hire a lawyer, one of the lawyers, it's actually somebody <coughs> in the neighborhood, who has an idea. Let's sue her. Madame Delphine was sued by the neighborhood, almost all of them, for interfering with the quiet enjoyment of their homes. Okay, that's a way to go. The mayor goes, I get you. I know what you're doing. Let's do this. Madame Delphine has fined nine slaves. It's like $150,000 in today's money. That was not for a noise violation. It's obviously for killing the child. But, but... Madame Delphine, oh, she, well, she agrees to let the nine slaves go. They're sold at auction. The city keeps the money. They weren't free. So Madame Delphine could find out through the records who bought them. She went and bought them all back. So she dropped about $400,000 on the thing. What they thought would be a, you know, something to curb her a little bit, she made into a personal crusade. You can't even hurt my feelings, she seemed to say. Then she threw a lavish party to show off that they couldn't hurt her feelings. Now, what's interesting is, in 1834... There was no torture entertainment like we have today. For 40 years, we've had Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies. All right? People get mutilated for our entertainment on television shows every night of the week. Criminal Minds, SVU, NCIS, CSI, Dexter, uh, Hannibal. We have series about good serial killers. We have, we're inundated with torture and mutilations and entertainment. The, what's just the Saw series of movies? That's twisted. The hostile series. We love this stuff. We do. There's mutilation and torture every day. 1834 is 11 years before Edgar Allan Poe published The Raven. This is a time without torture fiction. So if you're a slave owner, what you heard was 
A slave owner disciplined a slave. The slave died and was fined $150,000. That's crazy. That's a bad precedent. Because nobody would think this crazy woman killed a child because she enjoyed it. That wouldn't, that wouldn't click for anybody. It wouldn't make any sense. It's the time before the word sadist was in common use. There was no such thing as a sociopath. Nobody, these words didn't exist. So the neighbors watched it and they knew. But anybody else would hear the story and not think, oh, she's crazy, she needs to be stopped. So the lieutenant governor and aide were dispatched by the governor to this party to show solidarity for the major slave owner and, and businesswoman, Madame Delphine Because there are many sympathetic ears. So the party is raging. It's a Saturday night, everybody's having a good old time. And here's what's interesting. This is really the end. Madame Delphine's kitchen staff, who were chained to the stove, I say, keep saying staff, her kitchen slaves were chained to the stove while they're cooking. They set fire to the kitchen on purpose to burn down the house. They were going to die with it. Because even after she was really caught beating a child to death, nothing changed. And so they were just done. They were just going to die. And so they set fire to the kitchen. Fire rages. Now, it's not that big a fire, but any fire is terrifying. One house fire in 1788 burned 80% of the French Quarter. The neighbors would love for a house to burn down, but could be sure only her house would burn down. Houses are connected. So the neighbors come out, five brigades call. Prominent men of Louisiana at the party go running back to help with the fire. But Madame Delphine hears fire. She organizes her party goers and her servants to bring her furniture and artwork outside so it doesn't get smoky. So the party moves to the street out here, right? Everybody's having a good time, drinking, having a good time. Fire gets put out pretty quickly, even before the fire brigade gets here. The neighbors and fire brigade are all hanging around. And the kitchen slaves get something special. They get Madame Delphine away from them and prominent men of Louisiana that they could talk to. They could say, please help us. Go to the attic. Save us. Go to the attic. Save us. Go to the attic. The attic was on top. You see that laying on it? The sides of the house are different levels. There was like a storage unit built on top that filled out the space. And it was rare that it was in the attics are too hot here to store anything. So she built a shed on top of her roof. A strange thing. So Lieutenant Governor his aide, they go upstairs, grab a kid from the fire brigade. They see there's a lock on the door. They go upstairs. Party's in the street. Fire's pretty much done. They go upstairs. They hammer and chisel and knock open the door. What they see is terrifying. The fireman faints, is what they said. He swooned. What would make a fireman faint? Pretty grim. They walk in to this little storage unit, and they see a basket of severed human hands and a table with bloody and crusty implements, just horrible, sharpened, twisted blades and whatnot. As they look up and their eyes adjust, they see seven people, five, women, five men, two women, all slaves, strung up by the neck. They're like arms and legs pulled out of the sockets. So they hung like rag dolls. They had eyes gouged out, mouths sewn shut, holes in their stomachs, their intestines pulled through, hideous, horrible surgical mutilation and torture, maggots crawling all over them, flies, just this horrible stench of death. Horrific. Now, the lieutenant governor and his aide do the only thing they could think of to do when confronted with this scene. Now, sadly, we'd know exactly what this scene was. Somebody here is torturing people. Let's get the police. But they didn't think that. They thought they'd entered the actual hell. So they began to pray. Because you gave them five, it still wouldn't click. They wouldn't think somebody here is doing this. Who would do this? No one. It has to be the actual hell. So they start praying. Parties in the street. He's having a good time. Fire's done in the kitchen. Hell's on the roof. Nobody noticed the carriage leave. Madame Delphine got her. She saw the men going upstairs, knew it was over. So she grabbed her go bag, and she had like powers of attorney and letters and all this stuff. She had people who had been buying, trying to buy her businesses for years, and she kept them on the hook, knowing one day she'd have to flee. She got in her carriage. She and her husband and her three kids got to Biloxi the next day. She had a power of attorney set up at a law firm. She had them open up and start writing letters and sending dispatches. Within three days, she liquidated 60% of her assets and was on a boat to France, never brought to justice. The city was incensed when they found out, but it took a while. So they're upstairs on the roof for about a half an hour when the, they, when the lieutenant governor realizes some of these people are still alive. At least three of the people hanging up on their neck were still taking breath. So they scream for help. Help comes. The party breaks up finally. It's overwhelming. They, they died within hours of being discovered, everyone in the attic. Then, they begin to find the caches, the, the storage of hundreds of bodies, well, more than 100 bodies. Mummified remains of other people have been tortured by Madame Delphine de Lorraine and her surgeon husband, it turns out, because the, the cuts were too surgical. She would not have been able to do this herself and keep people alive for as long as she did. So they find the mummified and mutilated remains of more than 100 people in and around the Lollary Mansion, lined up on the sidewalk right here for the newspaper to do an illustration. The city was incensed. They were crazed with anger and frustration. There was nobody to bring to justice, nobody to, to pay for this. They took it out on the house. 
ransacked it, ripped the attic down. But by the time they were done, it was just a shell. People had painted murder and butcher on the side. And the mayor was the only one who got away, really, Scott Free. He had attended many of the parties, but everyone else who attended the party, because the mayor got ahead of it by finding her. He was ahead of the curve. Everybody else, like the lieutenant governor, is like, why didn't you know? Why didn't anybody know? It turned out Madame Delphine threw the parties on purpose to cover up the noise. Because even now, seven people with their tongues cut out going, mm! we hear it. What's that noise going on upstairs? Not if there's a big wild party going on. But Madame Delphine would go upstairs, hack people up, be covered in blood, come downstairs in a new outfit, showing off the latest fashions from Spain or France, changing her clothes three and four times during the night to cover up what she was doing upstairs. So that was, the whole system was set up for that. So the city, overwhelmed with grief, it just, they ransacked the house. The best article about it's in the New Orleans B. And what the guy says is, we lack the vocabulary. We don't have the words to describe the torment, the torture, the pain these people endure in the hands of the devil, Madame Dauphine already. And now, this, the city had to put guards up. People wanted to burn the house down, of course. It sat empty for almost 20 years. Then it turned into? <coughs> it's very different. It turned into a boys' school. You guys would have loved it. Probably not. <laughs> the hauntings began immediately in 1860 when the boys' school opened. Then it just sat empty for another 20 years or so. But the U.S. Depression it had fallen into complete disrepair and was a, a flop house. Just derelicts, drunks, uh, just living in squalor here. By World War II, it was renovated into an apartment building. Came known as the Lollery Apartments, although it was called something different, and the hauntings were legendary. African American tenants would give each other portraits of Madame Delphine to ward off the hauntings and hang it on your wall. And by the 70s, I found one picture. There's plywood in that window. We'll get into that in a second. But now in the 80s, a Shell Oil executive purchases it and uh, renovates it, makes it gorgeous again. And the 2000s, a guy like you, with a woman way too hot for him, like way out of his league. He's on the tour. But he's having a good time. He's been drinking a little bit. And he says, Wait, wait, you're not talking about the gray house, are you? Says, yes. It's my house. <laughs> this is how actor Nicolas Cage discovered he lived in the most haunted house in New Orleans. It was on a ghost tour with his girlfriend. Nicolas Cage is a big-time Elvis collector, and he married Lisa Marie Presley, bought her house on Esplanade <laughs> Avenue. She divorced him four months later and got the house. So he told his manager, buy me a bigger house in the French Quarter. Nick's manager buys him Murder Torture Manor. <laughs> Doesn't tell him that. <laughs> Nick did sign a closing on buying the Lollery Mansion, but he'd been drinking. <laughs> we have an open bar at closings here. So Nick moves in. In two years, everything went wrong that could go wrong for poor Nicolas Cage. Every movie right to the red box. Who needed Ghost Rider 2? Nobody. <laughs> Not only that, Nicolas Cage had the most dubious honor. He was arrested twice in New Orleans for drunken disorder. How, how, how do you do that? I, I literally, I've never known anybody be arrested for drunken disorder. I watched a guy with a big urine stain in his pants throw up on a police horse, not go to jail. And what do you have to do? I can, <laughs> twice, and he's a celebrity. So Nick leaves the house. He figures it's the house. He goes to the hotel. He tries to sue them. But he signed a document saying, the Lollery Mansion, most owned else in the world doesn't want to buy it. And so when he won't make payments, they foreclose. He has to file bankruptcy. <laughs> and the IRS came after him back taxes. Poor baby. <clears throat> the current owners have it on vacation rental by owner.com, though. So vrbo.com, look for family reunion spot. It sleeps 20. <laughs> 10 bedrooms. Got to rent the whole thing, though. It goes for 10000 to 25000 a week, depending on season. But uh, I think you can get weekend specials. And uh, <laughs> off-street parking, gourmet kitchen, slaves. all the ghosts you can eat. Party up. Let's do it. <laughs> they did say they replaced the glass in their window three times the first year they owned it. Three times. Because, uh -oh. well, right. Didn't he end up selling yeah, it for like 50 camera. cents That's on the dollar or something like something, that? Well, he, yeah, he, they got it for like half of what he what he paid for it because he was in foreclosure. Yeah. yeah so he yeah. lost a ton of money on it. Oh, but, man. Uh, at one point, the only thing he owned is his tomb in St. Louis Cemetery. He fixed his mojo. He spent $1.5 million to build a pyramid in St. Louis Cemetery number one near where Marie Laveau is buried. And so it's funny. Marie Laveau is not really magic. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Poor Nick. His tomb was struck by lightning. In St. Louis, it's all cracked down the side. It's hilarious. It's all national treasure, silly. Big 12 foot tall pyramid says Omnia ab Udo in Latin, all become one, or many of them. So if you go to St. Louis Cemetery, the tour guide will show you the future final resting place of actor Nicolas Cage. And in, in this big giant pyramid cracked because it was struck by lightning. Hilarious. Oh all right, we're going to walk two blocks to the haunted bar. 